We are so pleased this morning to be joined as well by Representative Zoe Lofgren from California. Congresswoman Lofgren serves on the Judiciary Committee, the Committee on Science and Technology, and the Committee on House Administration. She has written and sponsored various pieces of legislation that would promote open access to information, including the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act to expedite open access to taxpayer-funded research. Lofgren received an A in the Secular Coalition's Congressional Report Card of 2013. She is a strong proponent of separation of religion and government. Please help me in welcoming Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. great to see my uh, colleague, Bobby uh, Scott, we sit next to each other on the House Judiciary Committee, and he has a, been a tremendous champion of uh, the First Amendment and separation of uh, church and state, and we are lucky uh, to have him in the Congress. You know, I, uh, I don't know that I can um, replicate all that Bobby has done. I'm a strong believer in the First Amendment. As a person of faith, you have to respect people of other faiths and people who, who decide not to be believers. That's what our country really is about, that people can make their own choices. And I guess I'm aided in this uh, by my district. Um, you know, I, I remember years ago, a member of the House uh, and I were talking on the floor, and I was discussing the great diversity in my, my district. And I pointed out to him that I had more Buddhists than Baptists in my district. And he said, well, we have diversity, too. We've got Methodists and Baptists in the same town. So I do think that we have some issues when it comes to imposition of, of viewpoints in an inappropriate way. And I'll talk a little bit about the Science Committee, because uh, Bobby doesn't serve on that. You know, we have had uh, one of the most contentious sessions in the Science Committee, in the history of the Science Committee. You know, looking back, I've now been in Congress for 20 years. The committee, until uh, just recently, tended to be bipartisan. I think back to uh, Congressman Sherry Bullard, a, a Republican uh, from New York, a very even-handed individual who would uh, pull consensus together, because science isn't about ideology. Science is about science. It's about fact-driven decision-making. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, that has changed considerably. I think most of you uh, know, and I'll read the quote because I don't want to get it wrong, but a member of the Science Committee said, all that stuff I was taught about evolution and embryology and the Big Bang Theory, all that is lies straight from the pit of hell. This is a member of the Science Committee. Um, so we have had um, repeatedly partisan uh, votes uh, when we have witnesses or hearings, most of the Republicans spend their time trying to discredit the scientists, arguing about whether it's 97% of climate scientists who say climate change is happening, or could it be 93%, um, and really avoiding the issue of uh, the biggest um, challenge that we face in the world, which is climate change, and, and how to deal with this. You know, we've had, um, just yesterday's a great example, the uh, uh, energy uh, bill that was dropped in our laps uh, on Friday afternoon, barely meeting the notice requirements, doing huge uh, reductions in high energy physics and in other science endeavors and really going after anything to do with the study of climate change. Uh, you know, we're not going to have a healthy world if we don't empower and fund uh, the scientists who are leading us away from a, a worldwide uh, catastrophe. I, I just want to say, uh, uh, finally, that there is a, a, a ray of hope from time to time. We actually do get things uh, done. Uh, recently, in a markup of a bill that was that took us in the wrong direction and that I cannot support, we did have a little ray of hope. Um, I am indeed a, a co-sponsor of the bill to open up science research uh, to the world. Uh, we paid for it. 
uh, and, and scientists should have access to it. Uh, that bill has not progressed. Uh, but Jim Sensenbrenner, very conservative Republican from Wisconsin, also thinks that you know that science research ought to be made available. And so, uh, working with Jim and um, Tom Massey, who's a Tea Party Republican from uh, Kentucky, but he also he's he's got he's an engineer. He thinks scientists ought to have access to science information. So we were able to get that included in this bill. One of the things that uh, I think it's important about you being here today is to, is to make sure that the voices of really most Americans who believe that data and, and facts should drive the decision making get heard. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy uh, to hide behind um, uh, one's beliefs, uh, one's wishful thinking, when it comes to these hard issues that we're facing, especially with climate change, who wants to think uh, about that? Uh, but your voices, uh, urging a, an, an analysis of facts, urging um, action, I think is enormously important. Just a, a final word on uh, the climate change issue. This morning, we were, uh, the Aspen Institute holds uh, meetings uh, frequently with uh, speakers and Hank Paulson, former Secretary of the Treasury, uh, was giving a report that he's put together on the impacts of climate change. Uh, and he has uh, done it by region uh, in the United States with the business community, hoping to stimulate uh, some real attention on not the long-term, but near-term impacts of uh, climate change. And I'm hopeful that as we work with scientists, with uh, people who want to insist on uh, data-driven decision-making, such as yourself, uh, people in the business community who see that, we, that action is necessary, not criticism of scientists, that we will finally be able to break through on some of this uh, important issue. Uh, I, uh, I have time for a couple of questions if you want. I see lots of hands. So, um, if I know the answer, I'll give it to you. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for coming, Congresswoman. Um, what I want to say is the last times that I've gone on these uh, events, uh, a lot of the people, the staff people, have not even really known, have never met an atheist before, never met a person who's really interested in secular uh, uh, governance. Um, and so are you hearing more of a buzz amongst your colleagues? I mean, it, it just seemed like it was it was zero. Well, no, I'm not really. Um, uh, okay. But you know, to me, I, I actually I'm not an atheist. Um, so what? I mean, you have a right to your own beliefs, just as I have a right to mine. Whatever your belief system is, we need to be data driven right. in in the making of decisions in in the government. And I think that uh, rather than get in an argument with somebody about their individual, not, not that you would, um, because people have dearly held beliefs that are in oftentimes contradictory to other person's beliefs. It's not necessary to, to have a data-driven uh, decision-making approach uh, to government. I, you know, I have the, the largest Sikh temple in North America is in my district. And uh, when we had the grand opening, 10,000 people came. Um, the mayor of the city, myself, the governor of California. Before we were invited to speak, we had uh, welcomings from other people, faith communities. And you know, for the Sikhs, we had the Hindus, and we had Muslims, and we had uh, Buddhists, and Catholics, and Baha'is. And I thought, you know, here in California, people are welcoming to each other you know, where these religions originated, there's a lot more hostility and tension. I think America can lead the way uh, in, in acceptance of diversity and really understanding that diversity gives us tremendous strength. Yes, sir. As with many movements, in the secular movement, there are many groups that are a bit guarded about working with others, yet to make an impact, we have to unify on some issues. What's your advice for convincing these outsider groups to join us? Well, I don't, I don't know, um, you know, what advice to give you on, on that point. I just think that finding common cause on a specific policy issue is usually a good way to work together. I'll give you an example on something I'm working on right now, which is NSA surveillance. 
I think what is going on in the surveillance of Americans does violates the Constitution. The bill we passed uh, a few weeks ago does nothing uh, significant to address the issue. So who am I working with? I mean, some other Democrats, yeah, surely yes. But also, uh, Justin Amash, who is a very conservative Tea Party Republican, Tom Massey, a conservative Tea Party Republican. I don't agree with them on all kinds of things, but we work together on this issue. So I think finding things where you can collaborate actually helps you work on the next thing. Oh. Uh, my name is Jason Torpy. I work closely with the military community, uh, and I appreciate your commitment to science and and you know having your beliefs and and supporting science as well and what would you say it's not your district but it's right right around the corner at, at lamore uh, near fresno oh yes um the naval air station uh it's a very different part of california very different part yes over the over the hills uh the um so there's a navy chaplain there for the last month or so he's been sending messages you know it's the wing chaplain he has access to dis to do distribution to over 1200 sailors there on the on the station and he's been uh, inviting them to Bible study so they can learn how cave drawings prove that uh, people live with dinosaurs, uh, that evolution has never been proven, and that it's just a theory. So and that's, that's been for the last month or so, to, to 1,200 people using his official position to pr promote that view. Is that free exercise, or is that something that you know, is inappropriate for a chaplain? Well, I, you know, I don't know anything other than what you've told me, and certainly, um, Constitutional rights are not exercised in the same way for members of the military as they are for civilians, and we know that. But I do think that, um, that that's a very interesting report and probably ought to be brought to the attention of uh, the uh, Department of Defense. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Um, uh, there's been only a discussion about uh, uh, acceptance and visibility. Um, my question to you is, it, uh, we're seeing in the atheist and the non-believer community, I don't want to say just atheists, the non-believer community, whether it's atheists, agnostics, humanists, and science, we're, we're seeing examples of people who are afraid to declare themselves as non-believers because they believe there's a stigma there. I would say intellectually and socially, we're roughly where the LGBT community was maybe a, a few decades or so ago. My question to you specifically without naming names is, do you know fellow uh, representatives in your own body, House of Representatives, or senators who are in fact non-believers but who are afraid to come out? Um, not necessarily. I mean, to be honest, this is, religious is, beliefs is not something that I tend to talk about with my colleagues in the House. Um, you know, that's a private matter to me, and it's not something I ever discuss with other people. What I discuss is, you know, immigration reform and NSA surveillance and, uh, you know, legislative issues. So, you know, I'm kind of a live, let, let live person, and I do think you're right. I mean, especially in some parts of the country, um, non-believers are not uh, embraced or respected. I think that's less true, in, for example, in uh, my district, um, and I think if you, you if you take a look at the issue of uh, gay marriage and how quickly that went from that'll never happen to every state in the union is going to recognize gay marriage, I think that <laughs> um, the capacity for for the American people to change uh, is 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 very large. And I, I do think that whatever people's religious beliefs are, we, as a fundamental belief system, there's a big part of America that thinks, you know, what you want to believe is your business. Uh, it's live and let live approach. A, that's a very strong trend uh, in the American culture, and I think it works to uh, the advantage of freedom. This will be my last question, and i got to run back to the hill. Thank you for joining us here today. My question is regarding um, your efforts on the science committee. Yes. You mentioned that data and facts should drive the decision making with regards to research. How does the science committee ensure that the data and the facts that are presented for evidence is not junk science? Because as we know, there's much, there's many so-called scientific studies out there right. that are not statistically significant, have no relevance to the facts at hand. How does the Science Committee Well, I, I can't know, speak for that. the Republicans because I can remember we had a hearing on 
on climate and they had like an economy, they didn't have any science. We, they have three witnesses, we get one for each panel. So we make sure that we have on the democratic side a legitimate scientist. We also have something, I mean, the committee staff on the democratic side are scientists. Uh, and they uh, make use of the scientific community. We have an issue, we have an email connection so that you can get a quick answer. Uh, you know, it's not peer reviewed because it's on the fly, but you can get, uh, you know, information from legit scientists who are at research institute, uh, institutions or at uh, fine academic institutions. And to me, I mean, there's not always consensus, but if you follow the, the path that scientists do with peer review, you're going to end up with the best science possible. Now, I'll close with this. Um, the chairman of the committee, Lamar Smith, you know, he and I had uh, many contentious uh, battles when he chaired the Judiciary Committee, culminating with SOPA and the, and the web shut down, and now he's moved over to the Science Committee, so we get to fight again. Um, <laughs> he actually has laid out a plan where Congress will do the decision making. Instead of peer review, you'll have political review. It's a catastrophe. Every scientific society in the country is opposed to this trend. I thank God I think the Senate will stop it, but that's why elections do have consequences. Uh, and I, I hope that all of you will think about that uh, as this year progresses with the uh, oncoming uh, midterm elections. With that, thank you very much for all of you.